Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, you can also follow us uh, over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Become one of our friends over on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Well, we're embarking on a new series today, uh, but with uh, some of the same stars we heard in the last series. I'll get into that in a second. Before we do get started, I do want to remind you, as you make plans for perhaps a thriftier new year, remember the entertainment book. The entertainment book is full of great discounts in your own city on dining, dry, uh, dry cleaning, groceries, and much more. You can check out the uh, coupons in your local entertainment book by going to entertainment.greatdetectives.net. Well, The Abbots uh, is a bit of a different series and uh, a bit more obscure than I think The Thin Man or Mr. and Mrs. North. The Thin Man was uh, continues in popularity through its popular film series and also had a TV series in the 1950s. The Abbots uh, were a series of books written by Francis Crane. And there were no Abbots movies, but there was an Abbots, uh, the Abbott Mysteries radio series that aired from 1945 to 47. No episodes of that series uh, survive. However, NBC decided to revive the Abbots. It was the fall of uh, 1954. Radio was officially in decline. And this was one of the great comeback ideas that uh, NBC had. Claudia Morgan had been off the radio in the role of a detective wife since uh, 1950. So they decided to try and rekindle the old formula. The series initially starred uh, Don Briggs as Pat Abbott with Claudia Morgan as Jean, but by episode 17 of the series, which you're about to hear from January 23rd, 1955, very late in the golden age of radio indeed, I put it as Silver Age actually, Les Damon had taken over. Damon, of course, uh, having played Nick Charles. And 13 of the 18 Adventures of the Abbots episodes that we have uh, feature Les Damon in the role of uh, Pat Abbott. The episodes that we have are not actually from the 1954-55 uh, series run uh, over NBC. They're all Armed Forces Radio Service uh, presentations of the same uh, episodes that were broadcast over the Armed Forces Radio and Television um, in not, uh, 1957. However, for our show notes, uh, for simplicity, we'll use the dates the shows first uh, appeared. Each episode of the Abbots uh, followed kind of the tradition of the Francis Crane novels, in which a color was in the title. This was the, uh, Francis Crane's equivalent of the famous Mary Higgins Clark A is for, B is for, uh, murder mystery titles. Here now is the Royal Purple Scooter. After all, what would you do if your husband started to mix business with pleasure, especially if business was a horrible corpse and pleasure was an exquisite woman? <laughs> National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Jean and Pete Abbott, the nationally popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. Pat and Jean invite you to join them each week at this time on NBC for another recorded adventure in romance and crime. Tonight's puzzle in murder, the Royal Purple Scooter. And here is Jean Abbott. Well, I just called for Pat at his office. It was dinner time. My husband was ready to forget being a private detective and make a beeline for the nearest lobster a la Newburgh. Now, come on, Jean. We'll go down to the skipper's, relax, and I'll order myself... Oh, is that a customer? So late. I'm not expecting one. Come in. Yeah? Mr. Abbott? Yes? Uh, my name is King. I'm from California Fidelity. Have you got a minute? Uh, yes, Mr. King. Surely, sit down. This is my wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. King? What's on your mind, Mr. King? Well, Mr. Abbott, my company sells accident insurance, and um, we think that we have a job for you. Uh, what's the problem? 
You uh, mind if I deliver a short lecture on the uh, insurance business? None at all. Go ahead. The American public is really remarkable, Abbott. Now, our company spends a million dollars a year telling people to use a little common sense. But they commit suicide anyway. They spend a thousand dollars for a painting, but they won't spend 50 cents to fix a rug on the stairway. Then their best friend steps on it, falls, and knocks his brains out. They'll take six hours to hang that same painting on the wall. But they won't take 60 seconds to move a bottle of iodine out of reach of the baby. Now, I hope I'm not shocking you, Mrs. Emmett. Oh, no, please go ahead, Mr. King. Now, we've done everything under the sun to try to educate the public. But they go right on, sticking their fingers in the light sockets, standing under trees during storms, and stepping on the soap in the bathtub. You know, when I get the casualty tables, I often think that maybe Freud was right about the death wish. Maybe we like dying. Hmm. You'd think anyone but a congenital imbecile wouldn't light a match to look inside a gas tank. But a man in Sacramento tried it just yesterday. I just saw him at the morgue. Now we've got a new problem, and, uh, that's why I'm here. Well, what's the problem? Too many dangerous old cars on the road. Oh, I see. The American public loves this method of doing away with itself. Everybody and his brother has grabbed hold of anything on wheels that will move, and they're out on the road doing 90, and cars that belong in the junkyard. Cars with steering rods that snap, worn shoes that blow, brake linings that won't hold. Perhaps, uh... It's costing your company quite a few dollars, I imagine. Eh? It's costing California Fidelity thousands of dollars every day, Mr. Abbott. Now, we're geared to certain emergencies, but we can't see daylight on this one. So, our only hope is to make a test case. There was a chap killed in an auto crash on Locust Avenue last night. Here's the card on him. His name is MacDonald. Rick MacDonald. Oh, yes, yes. I think I read about that in the paper. Yes. MacDonald was coming down a hill near Locust Avenue. It's a bad one. Terrific grade, soft shoulders. Eight fatalities in the last six months. The city council has been too busy to fix it. They could have banked the curve, but they preferred to spend the money painting gold letters on City Hall. MacDonald went right off the road over a rocky cliff. He was alone in the car, wasn't he? Yes. He wasn't speeding, though. The meter was smashed at 32 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Did you find anything that showed why he spilled over? No. We had a top-flight mechanic take the wreck apart. Couldn't tell a thing. The car was too banged up. What do you know about the man who died? McDonald? Mm-hmm. Well, he was 42, owned a chain of drugstores, married. He seems to have kept out of trouble. He was what we call a good risk. I would bought the car just a, oh, just a few days ago. Mm-hmm. Now then, if we could show that the car was a death trap when he plunked down his $1,750 for it, if we could show criminal negligence by the dealer who sold it... Mm-hmm. Then you'd have a case. Exactly. Maybe then we could set off some legal fireworks and get out of paying these dozens of fat claims like McDonald's. His alone is a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand dollars? Yes. Who sold him the car? A chap named Tenike. Harry Tenike. He has a fancy lot over on 7th Street. Mr. Abbott, if you'd investigate for us, California Fidelity would be glad to pay any reasonable fee. All right, Mr. King. Now, uh, what do you know about the dealer, Tenike? Mm, not much. He's been selling used cars for a long time. Grabs jalopies cheap on the East Coast and palms them off in Dallas or here in San Francisco. He's about, uh, oh, 36. Single. No prison record, no legal trouble at all. Uh-huh. Okay, Mr. King, I'll take it from here. It uh, would be worth quite a lot to us, Mr. Abbott, if you could prove the accident wasn't necessary. Uh, well, it shouldn't be too hard to prove that some of the cars they're selling these days aren't exactly dreamboats. Some. Probably most of them. Insurance companies have such fine, trusting natures. Well, we're not dealing with the Vassar Daisy chain, Mrs. Abbott. The insurance company very often involves what Mark Twain called downright human cussedness. It's not a business for people with queasy stomachs or elaborate moral standards. Uh, have you anything else to tell me, Mr. King? No, I think that's about it. I guess you forgot one little item. I read it in the paper this morning. Oh, really? What was that? When they found that wrecked car... And McDonald's body. They found a scooter on the back seat. A purple scooter. Yes, yes, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. Well, the newspaper said that the McDonald's didn't have any children, so, uh... Why was there a scooter in the dead man's automobile? Oh. Oh, I see, Pat. You mean McDonald was murdered. <laughs> After Mr. King left, Pat and I headed for Harry Tonight's used car lot. It was a gaudy place of huge signs, glaring spotlights, and a public address system. 
Yes, sir, folks. Harry Tanak is crazy. Crazy? He's giving his money away. He wants you to drive right up here and sell your car. And Uncle Harry doesn't care what he pays for it. Not Uncle Harry. Sounds like the old army game, doesn't it, Pat? Uh, I think the odds in the army game are better. Oh, well, that must be Mr. Tanak over there. The salesman said he's a big, fat fellow with red hair. All right, now remember, Gene, I'm not a detective. I'm a customer. Uh-huh. We want to buy one of these terrific bargains from Tanak. Okay. Mr. Tenak. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm interested in that 51 there, the gray coupe. What do you want for it? Why, that's practically a brand new car, my boy. Bought that just this morning from a lieutenant in the Navy. You know how those Japs are. They take wonderful care of their cars. Uh, uh, how much is it? Well, it's only got 16,000 miles on it. The tires are perfect. It's got a radio and a heater. The I said, uh, like the... how much is it? Well, I'm not rightly sure. You see, I, I've already offered it to a dealer, so I may not be able to sell it at all. I don't remember what price he bid me for it. Well... Uh, what do you think it's worth, my boy? You try to remember the price, huh? Uh, I think it was, uh, 1600 uh, Is that about what you expect to pay for a car? Not for a car that's been in an accident, no. The way that one has. Now, where'd you get that idea, my boy? The fenders have been rewelded. The hood's been worked on. That car isn't worth 1600 Well, tonight. maybe it does need a little fixing, but, uh, I'll have my mechanic go over it for you. Is that you the kind bit? of a phony deal you made with Rick McDonald? Did you sell him one of these hot cars, one of these suicide buses? Well, where'd you get that idea? A little birdie told me. Very funny. Did you know McDonald at all? Or was he just another sucker? Now, look, bud, when I want quiz programs, I turn on the radio. Who are you, anyway? My name is Abbott. Pat Abbott. And I'm Mrs. Abbott. Who sent you here? You what they call a, a, a private investigator? Oh, they call me a lot of other things, too. Now, look here, Abbott. I did know Rick McDonald. Matter of fact, you happen to be a very good friend of mine. And I wouldn't chisel Rick out of a dime. The car I sold him was perfect. Yes, but there isn't any way of proving that now, is there? Rick knew cars, Abbott. He'd driven cars for 20 years. I couldn't have gypped him even if I wanted to. And besides, we were, we were practically buddies. So he'd trust you, eh, tonight? He'd take your word, blind, that the car was okay. Get out of here. I'd have knocked your lousy head off and hit him at our double cross, Rick. I had nothing to do with the way he got killed. He was on a crummy hill. Eight other guys went off the same road this year. That ain't my fault. And no penny and a Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you say here. you knew McDonald very well? Sure, I did. I've known the McDonald's for years. You must have known Mrs. McDonald, too. Dottie? Sure. So what? So nothing. Now, look here. Dottie's a good girl. You've been hearing that, that stuff about, about how she runs around? Now, they, they say that just because she's so pretty. That's so. Now, go on. Beat it, Abbott. You get out of here and forget my address. My oh, dear, you're coming around here with dirty cracks about Rick and Dottie. What are you trying to do? Show the boys you're smart? Show them that they hired a genius? What some people won't do to make a buck. All right. Easy, Tenike. Easy. You get out of here. You get out and make it fast before I take this ranch. All right. Away. All right. I'm going, Tenike. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you're just the way they describe you in the ads. Jolly Harry Tenayk, everybody's friend. As soon as we left the used car lot, Pat suddenly reversed his usual policy. Instead of ordering me to go home and stop bothering him while he was on a case, he actually sent me out snooping. He actually asked me to help him. He told me to look up Tim, our old friend who was an expert mechanic. He told me to check on people who'd bought cars from Tenor. I went dancing away, very happy that Pat had realized at last that I was a very valuable assistant. <laughs> this is Pat Abbott. Ordinarily, I don't barge in on Gene's storytelling, but uh, well, just between you and me... I could rid of Jean purposely. I'd given her a lot of useless things to do so that uh, I could go to see Mrs. McDonald uh, alone. Oh, all in the line of duty, of course. But from what I'd heard about Dottie, I knew I'd be better off if uh, there weren't any other women around. And she thought I was single. See, I wanted Mrs. McDonald to play every card she had without inhibitions. Mrs. McDonald's one of the most colossal little numbers I'd seen outside the pages of Esquire. Uh, sitting in her apartment, I thought that what Tenike called being a penny ante Sherlock Holmes sometimes had its rewards. Another Manhattan, Mr. Abbott? Uh, thank you, Mrs. McDonald. You're quite a mixer. Call me Dottie. 
You've been much too formal ever since you got here. Well, I'm sorry it's necessary for me to talk about your husband's death. Oh, that's all right. I guess I'm not the weepy type anyway. Oh, I'll miss Rick, and that's that. I'll miss him well for a while anyway. Sounds like you two... Uh... Oh, we got along as well as the usual married couple. Oh, you know how it is. Mm-hmm. Well, when you get married, you'll find there are lots of jokers in the deck. But, um, you didn't come here to talk about our marriage, did you? Uh, no, no. I came to ask you about Harry Tenner. You know him very well? The used car tycoon? Harry? Mm. Oh, sure. Uh, Harry and Rick both wanted to marry me. Uh, that was back in 41. Well, then we got into the war and Harry was drafted. So I married Rick. Later, Rick got into the drugstore business and made a lot of money. <laughs> it kind of burned Harry up. You know, first he lost me, and then Rick made a fortune while Harry was on the Anzio beachhead. Uh-huh. Was Tenak around last night, uh, before your husband went out driving? No, we hadn't seen Harry for a couple of weeks. Why? What are you trying to do? Hey, what are you getting at? I'm just trying to get at the details. Tell me something, Dick Tracy. Sure, what? Do you by any chance think I killed Rick? Could be. Oh, if you do, you're not as smart as you look. Why should I kill him? For the hundred thousand? I got all the money I want. Here, look at this necklace. You like it? Yes, very pretty. Genuine mother of pearl. Rick got it for me. Cost him five thousand. Hmm. Come closer. Take a good look at it. Yeah, that's... uh... That's well. You, uh, you like my dress, too? Uh-huh. Rick bought it. He thought it showed me off nicely. What do you think? Uh, certainly does. You like my perfume? It's another present. From Rick? Uh-uh. From a friend. Oh, I have lots of friends. Uh, oh, this perfume's $65 an ounce. Now do you think I have to kill Rick to make 100000 I don't know, yes. It's a wonderful perfume, isn't it? Uh-huh. Look, Pat, I can't go out while they're burying Rick. It wouldn't look nice. You know, there's a family downstairs, and, well, they'd be shocked. But, uh, I, well, I need a little company. You know, somebody to hang around here with me, and I thought, well, maybe you and... Oh, now, who could that be? I think it's my wife. Your what? Oh, uh, Mrs. McDonald, I'm Mrs. Abbott. How do you do? Come in, won't you? I, um, I was just talking to your husband. Hello, Jean. <clears throat> How'd you know I was here? Now, we'll talk about that later, Pat. Um, coming, darling. Oh, yes, yes, I was just going. Mrs. McDonald and I were discussing the, uh, legal aspects of the case. Did you learn anything interesting, Pat? Oh, yes, yes. Mrs. McDonald has been very informative. Uh, I'm sure she has. So nice to have met you, Mrs. McDonald. Well, I'm happy to have seen you, Mrs. Abbott. Goodbye. Hello. Goodbye. Pat Abbott. Now, Jane, listen to me. I was being very tricky with that woman. Yes, I can see you were. I purposely was giving her enough rope, you see, letting her go on and talk. Mm. I acted very innocent. I, <laughs> I was just looking for clues, and uh, how'd you know I was there? Right after I left you, it suddenly occurred to me. I asked myself why you were so anxious to send me off on errands. Then I remembered how the insurance man, Mr. King, described Mrs. McDonald. That was quite a legal discussion, Pat. With Manhattans all over the place, the mm-hmm. room smelling like a perfume store. Does Mrs. McDonald hold all her legal conferences in slinky, lounging pajamas? Well, I don't know. All I want to say... It must have been a very serious discussion. Oh, I can just see you, dear. Looking at Mrs. McDonald's backless pajamas and saying... Of course, what's most important is the case of Rittenhouse versus Humperdick, where a writ of no tell... Well, now, uh, look, Jean, if you don't trust me... I... I trust you, Pat. Do you know something, little boy? Yes, ma'am. Santa Claus up at the North Pole watches all the little boys year-round. So he knows who deserves to get presents. Uh-huh. He keeps a little book on you, Pat Abbott. And I'd hate to see what he just wrote about you and Mrs. McDonald. You would, huh? Hmm... You're not getting anything from Santa next Christmas, Pat Abbott. Back at Pat's office after we finished discussing Mrs. McDonald, we discussed the case seriously. 
I asked Pat what the next step was, and he stood up and announced very solemnly... In regard to the mysterious death of Rick McDonald... Yes? I'm going to take the final step necessary to solve the case. I'm going to, uh... Yes? I'm going to... Yes? Yes? I am going to play beanbag. Pat wasn't fooling either. Without any explanation, he left me flat in his office and went running over to the Locust Street section where, well, and he began to play beanbag with all the neighborhood youngsters. I decided that Pat was either disgusted with the case or temporarily insane. I decided this was a perfect opportunity for me to solve the mystery on my own. So I went back to Harry Tenike and his used car lot. I told your husband to stay away from here, Mrs. Abbott. Now I'm telling you, I get out and stay out. Then I tried Mrs. McDonald. I'm sorry, Mrs. Abbott, but there isn't anything more I can tell you. Oh, I think your husband covered everything very nicely when he was here. Three days went by, and all this time, Pat was still in his second childhood phase, playing one cat cops and robbers, and handball with the youngsters. He was on a sandlot watching a ball game when... Hey, some game, eh, Billy? Oh, boy, it sure is, Mr. Rabbit. Now, remember, if we win this one, I'm going to buy you a brand new first baseman's mitt. Oh, golly. Would you? Oh, boy. You got many toys, Billy? Oh, sure. I got millions of them. Uh-huh. Listen, Billy. You want to tell me a secret? Uh-huh. What? Well, it's about something that happened last week. Now, you can tell me the answer. You can trust me, you know. Sure. What is it? No, no, I won't tell a soul. But I want you to tell me the truth. Go ahead. Shoot. Billy, did you lose a scooter? That night, the minute Pat came home, he picked up the telephone and put in a call for Mr. King of California Fidelity. I hope King is home, Jean. You must have found out something very important to be calling him at home, Pat. Yes, I did. Hello? Uh, uh, Mr. King. Yes? This is Pat Abbott. Oh, hello there, Abbott. Well, you got something for us? Yes, I think I've got your answer. And the scooter did have something to do with it. Really? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I'll come right over. All right. Tell you what, my car's downstairs. I'll drive over and pick you up, then we can go to my office. I'll open it up, and I'll round up one of our lawyers, and then we'll get moving. You can fill out affidavits. Yeah, fine. I'll be over in, uh, oh, I should be there in ten minutes. Bye-bye. I'll be waiting. Bye. Well, Pat, what did you find out? Well, you're not going to make me wait for Mr. King, are you? I found out. Yes? I found out that beanbag is a much more difficult game than you think. We waited quite a while for Mr. King, almost 30 minutes. Pat got impatient and went to the corner stationery store for the evening papers. Finally, Mr. King appeared. We got into his car and drove off for the insurance office. All right, Abbott. What's the story? Well, Mr. King, in the first place, just as you suspected, McDonald didn't have an accident. Really? Go on, Abbott. Well, I spoke to Harry Tenike and to Mrs. McDonald, but the most fascinating item in the whole setup, as far as I was concerned, was a scooter found in the back of McDonald's automobile. Yes, yes, you uh, you said over the phone that you had something on that. Yeah, well, I made it my business to hang around with the kids who live near the McDonald's. I sort of built up a reservoir of goodwill with the gang of them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if one of them had lost a scooter, and sure enough, one of them had. His name was Billy Livingston. Great kid, Billy. Kind of devilish, too. You see, the night McDonald died, Billy had stolen into the back of McDonald's auto with a scooter. He was hiding back there, trying to sneak a free ride. Well, McDonald parked in front of a stationery store and had gone inside to buy a paper or something. And while Billy crouched on the floor in the back, someone came up. He lifted the hood of McDonald's car and jimmied the works, probably loosened the steering rod. Well, Billy got scared and ran away, leaving his scooter on the back seat. That's why it was found in the record. 
Well, after the news went around town, Billy was too frightened to announce that it was his scooter. Well, could Billy see well enough from the back seat that night to recognize who Jimmy the cop? Mm-hmm, he could, Gene. You mean the kid knows who committed the murder? He can identify them? He can. Well, who was it? Who killed McDonald? You did, Mr. King. Uh, Pat, you said... Yes, I said Mr. King did, Gene. I made a mistake, Emmett. I purposely hired you, figuring that it would be a nice cover-up for me. The double bluff, you know? The guy who pulled the gag, insisting that there be an investigation. <laughs> Seems I underestimated you. I thought you'd go up a blind alley or pin it on Harry Tenike. Pat, we've got... You don't have to do anything, Mrs. Abbott. I carry a thirty-eight. I've carried it ever since I killed Rick. Comes in handy now. I like to stop my car... You know, King, the only thing that bothered me is why. Why did you do it? Because of Dottie McDonald. I had a yen for Dottie. One of those bad ones. Makes you sick inside and pretty desperate. I sweated it out for a while, then she started to pay some attention to me. I went out with her a few times. Got to where I figured that if it weren't for Rick, I could be the number one boy. Especially since Dottie couldn't stand her husband. Being second in the league is no good. You get so you want to be first so much you don't care about anything else. Then Rick called. Wanted insurance on the car. I knew he'd bought a used one, probably a punk one. Harry Tenack hated Rick. So Harry Tenack was the perfect suspect, huh? Sure. And there was another thing. The hill near Locust Avenue where Rick lived. It's a dangerous incline. And automobile accidents make almost perfect murders. So I had all the cards. Yeah. Now, if you'll stay right where you are. In the front seat, there's some rope, Mr. Abbott, on the floor beside you. Will you pick it up, please, and hand it to me? And, uh, I think you're an intelligent man. I think you won't try anything. I think you know that if you do, I'll blow your wife's head off. Here's the rope. Now, don't move either of you. I can wrap a rope around you with my left hand, I think. So, and tie it. Down to the door handle. So, gotta pull it tight. There we are. What are you going to do? This is Abbott. The hill where Rick went over is just ahead of us. I'm going to start the car and then jump out. Simple, isn't it? No, you you can't do that. If we're found in your car without. Did you ever hear of accident faking, Mrs. Abbott? <sighs> That's another side to this fascinating business that I'm in. I had a long talk with one of the best accident fakers in the country last year. He taught me quite a few things. It'd be very easy for me to scratch my hands and legs and be found terribly shocked with the dead bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Abbott. We had an awful accident. You were killed. I was lucky. Pat, Pat, he can't. Easy, darling. Now I'll start the car. Now, if you don't mind, I'll be leaving. Pat, he's gone. You've got to stop the car. Tightest rope, too tight. I can't move my arms either. There's a hill, Pat, right ahead of us. Stop the car. Stop the car. Oh, Pat, you've got to stop the car. There's a hill right ahead of us. Come out, Billy. Billy? Okay, Mr. Abbott. Our friend Billy Livingston is with us, Gene. He's hiding in the back. You know what I taught you to do, Billy? Sure. I remember. I'll do it. I've just got to climb over this sea. Hurry, Billy, hurry. There's a police car back. They must have noticed this car is out of control. Now, go on, Billy. Do what I told you. Don't get excited. Now I take hold of the steering wheel. Right, Mr. Rabbit? That's it, boy. Take it. Hold on to it. Steady. Steady. Stop the car. Here's the hill, Pat. Here it comes. You know which pedal is the brake, Billy. I showed you that. Yes. Yes, I know. Now I step on the brake. Keep the wheel steady and straight. I... I can't reach the brake. My foot's too short. Try, Billy. Go on, boy. Try. Reach, Billy. Reach. You've got to step on that brake. Oh, it's... It's so hard to reach it. I... Oh, you're touching it, Billy. I... That's it. Now step on it. The hill. The hill. <laughs> Little Billy Livingston jammed his foot down in the brake just as we reached the soft shoulder on the curb. Just as we would have gone over. The police car behind us pulled up, and in less than three minutes, Pat led them to Mr. King. 
who was walking nonchalantly down the side of the road toward the bottom of the hill, where he thought we would be found dead. Later that evening at home. Pat, how did you happen to teach Billy how to stop the car? And, and how is it that he was hiding in the back anyway? Well, do you remember when I got impatient, waiting for King to show up? Uh-huh. I strolled down to the stationery store. Mm-hmm. Well, I picked up Billy. I thought King might try something like that once he knew I had him. And Billy seemed to be quite a little expert at hiding in back of cars by now, so I took him along as an ally. Very neat. Now, about, um, Dotty. Oh, yes, Dotty. Mm. Wasn't she gorgeous? Sort of a care package from Errol Flynn. She keeps going where Betty Grable leaves off. Wait a minute. Wait. What has she got that I haven't got? Now you come on out to the terrace in the moonlight, darling, and I'll take inventory. The National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those nationally known popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Gene Abbott, created by Francis Crane. We wish to thank Ann Corio for portraying the role of Dot McDonald in tonight's story. Our cast tonight included Mandel Kramer and David Pfeffer. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman. Produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert. Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. Next week, same time, same station, another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventures of the Abbots. This is Roger Tuttle speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, I certainly hope that uh, Pat Abbott has made out his well. He really does uh, seem to stretch the patience of his wife. Plus, I was a little unclear about the ethics of using a 12-year-old boy as an ally, thus putting his life at risk. But anyway, it was it was actually a pretty interesting mystery. Uh, Mandel Kramer, of course, who appeared in the role of the uh, insurance man, Somewhat ironic role because uh, Mandel Kramer is most famous for being the last Johnny Dollar. So an evil uh, insurance investigator. And I did like that he did at least uh, obtain permission to give a lecture before giving a lecture. And these type of public safety warnings were very common in radio and television of the era. In fact, a great episode of the TV show Racket Squad illustrated the danger of of cars that were dogs. So an interesting first entry for the Abbots. We'll be back with more tomorrow. 
In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.